and welcome to another episode of the Richmond Big Footy Tigercast. I'm your host Michaels, and for our first episode of 2018, we do have a very special guest with us today. He was drafted with pick number 25 in the 2000 draft. He played 92 games and kicked 39 goals, and he wore the number 24. Mark Coglin, welcome to you. Thanks, Chris. Good to be here, guys. Very good to chat with you. And like I was saying before, a lot of people have been asking about you. So yeah, I think they're all going to be very excited to hear what you've uh, with what you've been up to. But we'll, we'll start back with your early days. Was uh, was footy always your sport of choice when you were younger? I've heard you were a pretty decent cricketer and loved a bit of soccer as well. Yeah, I was just one of those. We sort of grew up in the in a, in the country, and um, you know whatever sport was on, was on on Saturday, I guess is what you played. So. Um, Footy didn't really become too serious until till my later teens, almost. Um, and then uh, I, I had sort of one standout year and got noticed and, and picked up by Richmond Footy Club in 2000. And what was the transition like into picking up footy later on in life, given that I suppose a lot of the players now start it when they're extremely young? Um, I, I suppose when I when you say picking up footy, I, I, was, I was, you know, kicking around the footy from a pretty young age, but... Um, yeah, it wasn't till probably 13, 14 actually started playing it, you know, on weekends and at school. Um, so yeah, but I, but I guess I guess there's there's sort of project players now that don't really pick it up till till later on. But I wouldn't really say I was one of them. I was more sort of half in, half out. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then uh, yeah, a bit of a late developer. One good year, and that was it. Over to Richmond. And in that draft in 2000, did you have many conversations with clubs prior to the draft, or was it mainly always Richmond that showed the most interest? Yeah, interestingly, interestingly didn't talk to Richmond at the draft camp. Um, spoke to, you know, maybe half the clubs half the clubs that were around at the time. Um, so it was a bit of a surprise draft day, actually, to go to, go to Richmond. I thought there were maybe a couple of, couple of options there that um, might have been might have been, uh, a, yeah, more of a chance. So, but yeah, it was a bit of a surprise in the end. Okay, and then once you were selected by the club, what was the process like for you having to move from Perth to Melbourne and how long did it all take? Straight over there, yeah. Um, Straight into it? Yeah, pre-seasons, I, I guess they wouldn't have changed. They, they start pretty early, especially for the younger guys. Um, I think the draft, the draft was a little bit later on now, whereas they tend to have it soon after the season, don't they, nowadays? yeah. Of, Two weeks. I know back uh, back early two thousands. It was all um, almost October, I think. So it wasn't wasn't a long turnaround before we were over there and into it. And what was the hardest thing to adjust to making the move down to Melbourne? Um, well, the club the club did it pretty well, to be honest. We um, we had a couple of host families, and the interstaters went went to them. Um, I, I got really lucky. I had a great family. Sue Morris looked after me for my first year. Um, she had Aaron Fiora the year before, um, and then went on for another f- quite a few years. I think I'm not sure whether Sue's still doing it, but um, yeah, they 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 did it all pretty well. It, it's either that, or you throw throw all the young guys into a share house, and I probably wasn't mature enough to handle that at the time. So um, yeah, <laughs> that'd be yeah, complete chaos, wouldn't good. they, if they did that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it depends. Oh, yeah, I guess. So. I guess you know. Um, yeah, doing your own washing and ironing and all that sort of thing is uh, it's 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 pretty it's all systems go when you get into pre-season. So to, to have all that done for you was pretty very handy. And what was the first day like down at the club? Was it a pretty daunting to walk in seeing all the big names that you would have no doubt seen on TV all those years before? Yeah, I had to do I had to do my research because I was a bit of a one-eyed eagle supporter. Um, but um, yeah, I think we were coming off a ninth place. I hate to say that um, <laughs> the year before. Um, after losing the close final in Sydney, and we had a really good team at the time. It was sort of Matty Knights, Brennan Gale, Wayne Campbell, Nick Daffy, um, yeah, all the Matty Rogers, all those those sort of names that are um, probably probably still household names, to be honest. The um, the Friday night footy, Monday night footy, you know, or Matty Matty Richardson. How could I not not mention him? Um, There's so, a funny story with him and you coming up later on, just to give you a heads up, or a story that he told about you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, all uh, all uh, been elaborated, I think. But um, no, I, I sort of yeah, I, I had to do a bit of research in, in, into how the club, yeah, into the makeup of the club. As I said, I was, I was pretty um, one-eyed as we tend to be here in the West. We're not we're not sort of um, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. You've you've seen the crowds over here. Yeah. <laughs> and you made your debut against Geelong in round nine of two thousand and one. At what stage during the week did you know that you were going to be selected to play your first game, and what was that moment like? Yeah, pretty good. I, I was. Maybe it was a, it was a little earlier than I expected. I think we, we were having a really good year. Um, we were in the top four at the time, and uh, I would have found out maybe a Tuesday. I think Danny had a quick chat, and um, yeah, I, I was I was in. I started on the field um, in the middle. As, uh, Matty Nice was getting tagged, and we we. Uh, Started him on the bench, so my role is just purely try and break the tag. To be honest, um, and pretty unforgettable day. Actually, we didn't we didn't play too well. That was a famous day that um that someone someone landed a bit of chicken manure on the front door that the following week. So um yeah, it it brings back bring brings back fond fond memories for it uh, being the first game. But um the actual day, uh, given that we were we were playing pretty well at the time, wasn't too from crash hot as it, it tends to be down down at Geelong. Did it help starting on the ground in terms of coping with nerves leading up to the first bounce? It was all a bit of a blur, to be honest. Um, yeah, it probably it probably did. Um, I was I was the sort of guy that got fairly worked up before games, so um, I was I was super nervous leading into it. Um, but once once you're on the ground, I, I'm sure everyone says it and you hear it all the time. But once you're on the ground, you sort of you sort of just get on with it, and it's. Um, bit of tunnel vision, just, just eyes on the footy. And in 2002, you played 16 games and really announced yourself as a young emerging player. Was there anything in particular you worked on that pre-season to get yourself primed for a big year? Yeah, what did I need to work on? Um, uh, it was pretty tough getting a gig in the middle um, early days with, with, with who we had, had there. Um, Cambo, Nida... Uh, Paul Broderick was there at the time, so they were pretty established, sort of in the middle. Um, I, I guess I had to, um, yeah, I was, I was I was a bit of an inside player, so I had to had to knock out a couple of those guys, and um, probably my tank, to be honest, I didn't have the best tank going in. Um, I was pretty, I was physically reasonably mature for my for my age going going to the club. Um, but you know what what you give up there, you sort of lack in maybe running out of game. Um, so yeah, I, I really had to work hard on the endurance side of things and, um, and getting the running up, dropping maybe a couple of kilos. So I think I did that in my second pre-season. I, I got a full pre-season and felt really confident. And um, yeah, yeah, training with, with all the training and fitness, you do you do get your confidence up for pre-season games and all that sort of thing. So I think the one thing was that that endurance side of it. <laughs> uh, the 2002 season unfortunately wasn't as successful as our 2001 year. Was it hard within the team to deal with the the performance drop? I suppose from the previous year. How how was everyone coping with that? Yeah, really, really, really hard. Um, I think we sort of had had it was it was a lot of expectation that year. Um, some people I remember even penciled us in for the flag um, after it. You know, representation in finals the year before. So. Um, yeah, I think the I think the boys sort of struggled with it a bit, especially the you know Cambo and Matty Knights and these guys that were, or you know Knight was certainly towards the end of his career. So um, to build it up and and to you know to to put out what we did was a little bit disappointing. I don't think we could have blamed, blamed injuries or anything like that. We just yeah for whatever reason didn't put it together. And then in two thousand and three, you personally had a brilliant season. You won the Jack Dye Medal as a young player. What was that like for you to win such a special award? Um, at, at the time it was, I, I really think it was because the opportunity Danny, Danny gave me, um, I worked, you know, inside out with Brad Ottens all pre-season, um, Danny said, you, you know, you're going to be our sentiment all year from, from the day, day one of pre-season, so re- really footy, footy and, and sport in general is about that opportunity, so, um, you know, if, if you've been granted that, um, you know, if you've been given that sort of position of being able to um, privilege position that Danny gave me, you, you sort of—I didn't really want to let him down and the team down. Um, and if you're playing, you know, you're playing in the middle for 80, 85 percent of the game, you really should be 
producing the sort of numbers, you know, that a that a centerman should. So, yeah, I, but it was a, it was a good year. I just had a good good run with injuries and um, body felt really good. And having Big Otto tap it to you uh, every centre bounce is pretty handy as well. <laughs> And you mentioned about being an inside player. I suppose one of the highlights from not only your 2003 season, but your career as a whole, was your tackling and hardness at the ball. Was that something you always put a lot of work into? Well, yeah, people say that. And um, it was actually interesting. I, I, I didn't really... Growing up, probably wasn't... I was a bit of a late developer, so I was a bit of an outside, uh, more skillful type of player. Um, but when I got to AFL level, I realised... Um, it was around about the time 2000. It was Brisbane's the year they won the flag, and you, you sort of what sort of what team they were. And Danny, Danny, <laughs> Danny just gets saying, "You got to be our market boss. You got to be our market boss." So I just had this sort of, um, I had to change my game around really, um, and become that sort of. Well, I wasn't I wasn't quick on the outside, so you know the only way you're going to survive is to win the ball in close and um, tackle and harass and all those sort of things. So. I sort of had to do it to survive in the game, really. And, yeah, you didn't mind a bit of physical contact. And I think this... I don't know if this was in 2003 or one of those years either side, but there was one moment that there's still footage of to this day. It was when you lined Campbell Brown up off the edge of the square, but you come off second best. And uh, Campbell Brown gave you a bit of a spray. What do you remember about that incident? And do you remember what he was saying to you? Um, remember what he was saying to me? I... Yeah, it was sort of it was a centre bounce, and Greg Greg Stafford whacked it forward. Um, I was starting in the half forward line, and they were in the days where you probably could bump, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think it was I think it was fair, and to this day it would still be fair. It, it, um, well, I think so too. But uh, yeah, Cam, Campbell Campbell and I had a few few moments on the field, all good mates off it. But um, he certainly did get better of me. I think I left the ground. He sort of got under me and. Um, took the absolute sales out of me and uh oh whatever he said he said at the time I don't... yeah he was he was yeah, pretty yeah, fine yeah. i think it sparked um, a bit of a minor melee <laughs> minor melee at the mcg yeah yeah, um, yeah no it was all it was all good fun and 2004 i think you were cut down a bit by osteitis pubis is, is that something that's really tough to manage it is because you can't put a timeline on it so with a knee or a hamstring or anything like that you sort of know you know you're you know the physios and doctors know, um, whereas osteitis pubis is a is a test of your strength every you know every week, every day. They they're on top of it now by the sounds of it. You don't really hear of um, players going down too much of it these days. But um, uh, back ten years before I was playing, I think players you know players careers were sort of taken out. They didn't know a whole lot, whole lot about it. They just sort of said sort of thought of it as repetitive strain, um, groin strains. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, it was it was pretty. It was a pretty hard one to, to deal with because you you'd feel great one day and the next day you couldn't couldn't put your pants on. So and it's just rest, um, isn't it, to to get over that virtually? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, yeah, it's a little bit debilitating in that in some ways because you can't. It is almost it's not bed rest, but you're not allowed to do a lot on your legs just to completely avoid. Yeah, to to not not be able to run for six months, twelve months, even if it's real serious, is is pretty hard. In 2005, you had a full season and got back into some good form, which carried over into 2006. Until that game against the Hawks in round 12, where you did tear the ACL, falling awkwardly. What do you remember about the incident, and did you know straight away that you torn the ACL? Yeah, oh, I knew it wasn't good. Um, I think oh, I think the week before, or a couple of weeks before, we played Geelong down at Cadinia Park, and um, felt felt. I think I did a bit of damage to it, then to be honest, and then. Um, that, and that's what a lot of players do. They might might tear, you know, 25, 50% of it. And then um, some players go on and go on with it okay. Whereas, um, yeah, I, I just had an incident where sort of got a bad uh, got, an, got a bad handball, tried to go the other way, and that's, it just went. So, yeah, I, I, was, I was pretty sure, sure of what I'd done. And how tough was that mentally to have to sit on the sidelines and go through the rehab while you're watching your teammates play each week? Yeah. Um, yeah, tough. Uh, rehab's mentally tough. It's just I don't know. It's like it's like anyone going to work and sitting in the corner and supporting everyone, but not being able to actually put in. You know, you just feel like you're not putting in. Um, and that was a, that was the hardest thing to deal with. Rehab itself is actually 
it's it's you know it's it's actually pretty simple. You rock up, you do you have a swim, you have a bike ride, you do a few weights, and you haven't got the pressure of game day on the weekend. So yeah, I know, I know. Um, I think it was Lee Matthews at Brisbane. If um, players got long term injuries, he sort of sent them out of the club for a while just to get them away from things and, and the players themselves because they got a job to do and all that sort of thing. I, I don't know whether that was the best way to go, but. Um, yeah, it's you, you just feel like a supporter, so you know you're there for the guys week in week out. But they're doing the hard yards on the field, so that was the hardest thing. And then you're putting in obviously all the hard yards to set yourself for the 2007 season. But then the pre-season you, was it a slip in the shower? I think it was reported that caused the tear again. Is that is that what happened? Yeah, that's been brought up a few times. I um, there were there were a couple of incidents at training and. There was a slip in the shower, which, which, again, I just, I, I never felt confident in um, from day one of that of that surgery, um, and I think I just, yeah, we sort of kept it to myself and um, had a couple of incidents where it just didn't feel right until, to the point where we, I didn't actually do it again, um, but we we had a few scans and we realised that it was a bit of a, um, it was a weak ligament and that we needed to to redo it, so. Um, I can't actually put my finger on the incident. That that was one one of many incidents that um just wasn't a wasn't a strong knee at the time. Then having just gone through obviously the first one and having to back it up again straight away, did that hit you harder? The fact that you were going to have to do it all over again, or were you more I suppose mentally prepared, knowing what was in store for you this time around? Yeah, oh, no, it was harder because it was the start of the pre season. Um, sorry, it was the end of the pre-season, so I knew I was going to miss another full year. Um, yeah, and I could see the game was changing and all those type of things, so I knew I could get myself super fit and in line for the, the following year. But um, yeah, the knocks, the knocks, and all the, the game day sort of side of things, I knew that it would take me a bit of time to get back into it. And did you ever speak to anyone like a Mark Dragasevic who'd gone through something similar? Dragger was wasn't at the club at the time. Um, I'd spoke to I'd spoke to guys that, that have done a, a couple of knees, um, but really I think it's just the individual. You, you sort of you know what you're dealing with. Uh, again, you've got a time frame. You know it's you know it's twelve months to really heal. Um, and the club were like beyond um, sort of uh, you know beyond helpful in, in sort of um, you know. Saying that you know we'll, we'll definitely give you another year or two once you're ready, they they sort of left it up to me. Whereas they could have easily just sort of said, well, you know your body's not up to it. Sort of, um, you know, might might need to move on. So I was I was pretty lucky with the club. Really, they sort of really really uh, supported me through that two years of, of not playing a game. Then after those two years, you made your return to the senior side on the 25th of April, 2009. That must have been an amazing moment for you and your family. Um, how nervous were you before the game? Yeah, pretty nervous, but just n- not as nervous as, say, say my first game. Um, yeah, I, I knew it was going to come, and it was a long time waiting. It was just a bit of relief, really, and a bit of a monkey off the back. I'd played a lot of VFL up to that point, so I um, had a bit of footy behind me and under my belt. Um, just more interested to see how the game to get out there and see it, yeah, see the see how the game had, had changed. I think it was Eddie had against uh, North Melbourne and the ball was pinging around. I didn't have much of an impact, so um, yeah, it was more just for, you know just relief to get it out of the way the first game. And you caught one of the biggest Gatorade showers of all time after that win. Yeah, I did I did? <laughs> yeah, not enjoyable. Uh, in 2009, you also spent a bit of time training and playing with Ben Cousins. What was he like to have around the club? Yeah, Benny was good. I um, I actually went to I been, actually went to the same school with him um, back in um, back in Perth days. He he wouldn't have remembered me, but I certainly idolised him. He was sort of in his last year of high school when I was in my first. Um, so. It's pretty interesting the way that one all worked out. I, mean, I think he's, you know, no club was interested in um, in sort of taking him on, um, but at the, at the sort of death bell we did, and um, I don't think anyone would 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 have any ill thoughts of having been at the club for the, was he there for two or three years? Yeah, what I mean? was, yeah two or three, yeah, because he also had a bit of time on the sideline as well. But, I mean, from yeah. a spectator point of view. 
I think a lot of us saw the impact he had on the playing group in terms of the things he was able to teach and bring over from his days at the Eagles. Yeah, yeah. But the thing about Benny, I mean, his, his, his old man is he's a sort of legend of the game here in the West as well. So all he knew, he lived, breathed and ate footy. So his actual knowledge, and he'd been, he'd been to grand finals, he'd, he'd, he'd had, had a lot of experience. I think he's the best player that West Coast ever had. Um, and he... Uh, so... He, he just yeah instilled that um, that knowledge of the game on, on the playing group and 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 yeah he certainly had we'd had Kane Johnson at the club who'd won two flags at Adelaide mm-hmm. so I think you need to sort of try and recruit those type of players when I mean, we hadn't we hadn't had many of the lads at the club go through that um, we're trying to certainly trying to get there so to get those guys in um, was 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 good was good. And sadly, the final round of 2009 was your last game for the club. There's been some mixed reports about how you were told and how this all came about, but the one that keeps popping up the most is that yourself and Nathan Brown were told literally just before the last game of the year that this was going to, going to be the last game for you. Is that actually how it played out? Uh, well, I think we knew the writing was on the wall. Um, is, is it, I don't think there's really a good, way, good or bad way to do it, to be honest. We knew, we knew the club was developing... Um, yeah, could we have gone on? Maybe, but but you know, to be playing in the VFL while you're trying to give the Shane Edwards um, and Richard Tamlings and these sort of guys guys a go was we knew that we knew that was going to be hard. I'd seen I'd seen a couple of players sort of um, go down the same path before me, so we all knew where it was going. Um, and to be honest, yeah, I mean, I wasn't really too interested in, in that myself, sort of playing second fiddle. So better to sort of just. Was there ever any thoughts of trying to get onto another team's list at all? Yeah, yeah, I, I did think about it, but um, I guess you, you've 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 got to have that that desire, that hunger that you had when you when you were seventeen, eighteen, just being picked up. And yeah, if I, if I was going to be honest with myself, I didn't. Um, so best to sort of yeah, best to sort of move on. And um, yeah, I had, I had a few other interests, so. Um, Get on, get on with that side of it. And what was the transition like for you from AFL football to life after football? Was there much assistance ever provided by the club or the AFLPA, or were you kind of left to your own devices? Heaps of support, no nah, heaps of support. So the club will give you. I mean, you've got two or three years to get anything you want sorted with your body and all that type of thing. The AFLPA is fantastic um, at at um, putting you through a uni course or setting you up. Um, you didn't realise it at the time, but but footy clubs will, um, and the support base will, you know, you can just about pick up the phone and call anyone, and they'll, um, you know, they'll they'll answer your call and have a chat with you, and a lot of people want to help you out. So, um, no, no, I've got no, um, that was nothing but positive. I, I sort of through the through a director of the club, at at the time, um, got set up with my first job in Melbourne, which was which was great and lasted a few years. So and, yeah, and you're currently working at Murray Engineering as a as the commercial manager. How did you get into that role, uh, and how long have you been there for, and what does it all involve? Well, Murray's is a um, pretty diversified sort of engineering manufacturing company. Um, so how did I get involved? I so I finished an accounting degree and, and finance. Um, yeah, towards the end of footy, and then then my first year out of it, just sort of went out of a public accounting firm and. Um, Got, got some skills up in Melbourne. A few years, few years there post footy. Shot across the Perth and um, got into the mining industry over here. And yeah, yeah, Jesus, it's, it's ten years, ten years since. Uh, well, almost ten years since my last game. And um, uh, yeah, just nine, the nine to five job is uh, just getting that out of the way every day is a little bit um, certainly different change of pace to to the good old days but um it's footy teaches you a lot um a lot you know discipline of having to be at a certain time at a certain place not not letting your teammates down and um i guess you, you translate that or you transfer it to whatever you're doing in life post that so um yeah i feel like i've got a pretty good work ethic and you know um and they, just come, they come from the days where you might have missed a Missed a rehab session or training session, and getting a reasonable spray from Danny Frawley at the time. So, I think that's sort of instilled in you, and you, um, yeah, 
you, you just um, you transfer it across. And do you still follow the Tigers closely? The, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but a few listeners mentioned they saw you out and about after the grand final. Did you happen to go to the game? Yeah, loved it. Um, we're uh, we're travelling around the. I sort of we had a had a month month holiday with my wife. A uh, a bladder, and then didn't see any of the games in the lead up. We didn't see the Geelong game. Um, the uh, GWS um, game, all I just say. I was really, really keen, itching to get a ticket to the, to the granny. And um, we jumped on a plane from the US, took off took off to Sydney, not knowing whether we'd get tickets. I think that was a Tuesday or, Tuesday or Wednesday. And, and by the time we landed, we'd, um, my brother had managed to, to grab some snaffle some. So, yeah, straight down to Melbourne. And um, it was probably, uh, I, I won't tell my wife, this was one of the best weeks of my life, haven't I? <laughs> Having a holiday like that, coming coming down um, and seeing seeing the Tigers Tigers win a flag, um, and I, I didn't have any expectations sort of going into it. You know, Adelaide were a great team all year, but um, but uh, yeah, when Dusty snapped that one in the was it the last or the yeah, third quarter? Yeah, the last. Yeah, yeah, the last quarter. I think yeah, that was time to start celebrating. Absolutely. And I've asked a few of the the other past players this their thoughts on the um, Adelaide Crows power stance. Do you have any views on their little pre-game stance? Yeah, I, being at the ground, I, I I should have noticed it, but I think we're just you know um, just wanting the wanting the ball to bounce. So I, I didn't didn't really didn't really notice till after till the next day and read the papers. But um, yeah, um, yeah, but worked out for them. They had a win, then no one would have said anything about it, would they? But true. They um, they they. Oh, I can just cut out there a little bit. That's right, I got you back. Uh, all right, before we let you go, we have a, we did have a few questions come through from listeners. Like I said, there was a huge response from people when they heard you were coming on. Um, so this is, I suppose, people who've done their own research or might have heard bits and pieces from the past. So. Bear in mind that it may or may not all be true. But uh, the first one was: Is it true that before the end of season trip in 2003 to New Zealand, that you left your passport in Craig Edney's car, which Craig had taken up to Yarrawonga? Um, I lost my passport. I lived with uh, Craig Edney at the time. If he had something to do with it, we, I still would have a word, words with him now. But uh, <laughs> um, I think he actually helped me out in. in in getting it from uh, Australia Post because we had to rush one through, otherwise it wasn't getting on the flight. So, no, no, he, he was uh, he had my back heads. Oh, that's good. Uh, the second one was you lived with Brett Lidio for a while when he was a lot younger as well. What was that like? Who did all the cooking and the cleaning, and, and how did the dynamic of that household work? <laughs> Lids, uh, he's he's a bit of a pain in the ass because he was so um, he was so competitive. Lids, he'd, he'd, he'd literally leave for uh, training at the same time. Um, in your cars, and he'd have to beat you to training every time. So, I deliberately went about ten k's over the speed limit just to make sure he'd, he'd pick up a few speeding fines. But um, no, no, he was he was good, really mature kid. He knew what he, he knew what he wanted at the time. I reckon he's you know he had a sort of plan and a path. Um, and uh, yeah, he was um, re- really good to his family. Um, really supports his family and his brother, his sister. Um, so he was uh, a pretty impressive kid as an 18 year old you're talking about a guy that could bowl 140 k's an hour cricket ball and run 100 and 111 seconds and uh, yeah it was a bit of a power athlete like unbelievable on both feet and uh, um, just one of those sort of prodigy types you know yeah uh, and you were also I think you were part of the junior leadership group while at the club. What did that involve, and was there ever aspirations to become the captain of the club one day? Yeah, you re- it's a bit of a cliche, but you, you don't really think about that when you're when you're in that position. You just sort of, you know. Um, I think it's about I think it's about just putting in on the field um, and obviously off it. Um, so if all that works out well, and you you, you know you you're performing week in week out. Um, then maybe that you know maybe the, the leadership side of things probably comes, but um, it didn't really work out for me in that way. So 
um, I wasn't too too bothered with all that. I, I was just more keen to sort of get out on the field and play as many games as I could. And another one from a listener was apparently you were good mates with Kane Pettifer. Did he really have tickets on himself like some of the stories suggest? suggest? Yeah, I lived with Kane for a couple of years. Um, he was a confident kid. Um, I think he'd kick, kick most goals in the um, TAC Cup the year before and won the uh, under-18s state carnival sort of best player. Um, so he was, yeah, a typical forward, I think. They're, they've all got to have a bit of sort of bit of that about them. Um, down in the dumps, if they don't kick a goal, three or four goals, little handbag, and they're um, sort of perked up around the club. Jack Rivas, no different. Um, so, yeah, you, you want them to be cocky and confident because it means they're kicking goals. And speaking of uh, Fords, what was it like playing alongside Rich Owen Brownie? Pretty good when they're up and going. I think it was 2005 that, um, yeah, it was coined the Bat- Batman Robin show. They, they were on fire, the two of them. Um, uh, so it was it was really good. It was really good. Um, I think Rich Owen was a bit bit starved of having that that real quality delivery inside forward for the um, until. Well, I'm going to offend a few people here, but. Um, until Brownie rocked up, he was um, yeah, he was the most skillful player I've ever played with, Nathan Brown. Um, tragedy when he broke his leg because he, he was in, in serious form at the time. Um, so that, that was fantastic. Um, yeah, just just basically get an inside fifty to, to Brownie. It didn't matter how you kicked it to him; he'd sort of scoop it up off his ankles and it wheel around. And yeah. Wheel around, and, yeah, hit hit Brownie, hit uh, hit Richo up. I think they still have a kick kick to this day if I'm not mistaken and um, they have a bit of a laugh about it because uh, I think Brownie kicks it to the places where he used to kick it and Richo can't quite jump as high or <laughs> can't run as fast so the ball either drops short or goes over his head it's quite funny and the, the last one before we let you go this is yeah, a great story from Richo uh, quite a few people mentioned this to me that they heard this story and I don't know if you've heard it or not, but Richo on the Richmond podcast told a story about a young Mark Coglin meeting an attractive woman, going home to her house, and then discovering you'd traipsed dog poo across her carpet. <laughs> Can you confirm or deny? Yeah. I can't deny that. No, I can't <laughs> deny that. Um, I, did, I did clean it up, though, so I did the right thing. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah, there's sort of, the sort of things that make a footy club go around, so... <laughs> I'll have, to, I'll have to get him back. Brownie's a shocker. He's, he's, he's thrown me under the bus numerous times. Yeah, that, that is what it's all about, though, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah. All right, well, thank you so much for coming on, Mark. Really appreciate your time, uh, and good luck with the, the current role you're in, and, um, yeah, hopefully the Tigers can keep winning some games as well. Yeah, well, what's Dusty signed up for, what, for seven years, was it? Yeah, something like six that. Six years, yeah. six years, seven years. I'm, I'm coining it the Dusty Dynasty, so... Um, Nah, it's good. Keep winning, boys, and um, keep us. Uh, it's it's good for us here in the West to be able to get into the Frio and uh, West Coast supporters. Um, gives us uh, gives us a bit of leverage, that's for sure. Absolutely, everyone over there, keep wearing your Richmond stuff with pride and get stuck into them. We've got plenty of supporters. We've got plenty of supporters. The uh, Premiership Cup got brought around to the West, and yeah, we had ten thousand people at people lead all over there. So, no, nah, that's. Yeah. Um, it's the old, uh, the old supporter base from the, the good old days, I think. They've all, everyone stuck on. Oh, that's good to hear. All right, well, thank you again, Mark, for your time, and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Chris. See ya. Thanks, mate. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Richmond Big Footy Tiger Cast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and YouTube so you can follow all the roasts and toasts, the reviews and previews, and all topics Richmond. Also keep an ear out for our special episodes of interviews with past players. Go Tigers!